Dr. Ahuvia, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent. But before we jump in, I wanted to ask you, how does an angel start a fire? How? I don't know. With a match made in heaven. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> oh. Terrible. That is as infantile of a joke as I have ever told. Anyways, hello everybody. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A <laughs> podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. My name is Douglas Bachelor, and today we have a massive topic to go over. One that many folks have asked me to do for quite some time. But it's not really something which can be done in one episode, so I hope that this will be one of among many. The topic itself is huge, but I really want folks to get on the right footing for this sort of thing, as there is a lot of hot takes and privileging of certain aspects that go along with it. Today, we are going to be talking about angels, their origins, and their earliest conceptions up to antiquity. So we're going to be stopping in around the 4th century or so. That's the 4th century AD or CE. And helping us with this is someone whose book, on my right, Michael, on my left, Gabriel, Angels in Ancient Jewish Culture, which was such an absolute delight and informative look at early angelic beliefs that I absolutely had to have its author on the show. She received her PhD in religion from Princeton University in 2014, specializing in the formation of Judaism and Christianity in late antiquity. She is an associate professor of classical Judaism at the Henry H. Jackson School of International Jewish Studies, Comparative Religion, and Global Studies in Seattle, Washington. Today, helping us go through the origins of angels is Dr. Mika Ahuvia. Mika, I'm asking you again, how are you? My goodness, there's there's probably a lot going on in your life right now. I'm I'm doing great. And it's always a pleasure to talk about angels. I picked a topic I liked and got to stick with it for a while. (laughs) I have to ask you, were you always interested in angels? I don't think so. But my mother does remind me sometimes that I used to have like pictures of cherubim on the wall when I was a teenager. So maybe there was something there. I don't know. Um, My name is, you know, Mika, M-I-K-A. It's uh, short for like Michael, right? And Michael, right. of course, <laughs> angels. My last name, Ahubia, um, means like beloved of God. So I don't know. There's maybe some like, if name is destiny, you know, which is a kind of a superstition in Judaism, then yeah, maybe I was uh, destined for this. <laughs> it was written. It has been written. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So good. So, well, I, let's jump right in here because I can't wait to talk about this. And I think this is incredibly important. Again, lots of hot takes. People will be like, ah, this is where angels come from. It's straight from this Canaanite belief of of these chaos serpents. And it's like, ah, hit the brakes there, bud. You might need to examine this a little bit further. Big first question. What is an angel and where does the word angel come from? Okay. So first of all, um, I think my research has taught me that there is not one single definition of angels that will hold true across all cultures across time. So every community kind of relates to this concept um, of an angel differently. But answering where the word angel comes from is a little bit easier. It comes from the Greek angelos or Latin angelus, Hebrew it's malach. What's interesting is that in all these languages, the angel can mean a messenger who is either divine or mortal. And what we see in some of the earliest stories about these angelic figures is that sometimes people think they're talking to a a human and then there's like this really dramatic departure and the person's like, oh, that was an angel. (laughs) Or the message they get makes them realize, oh, that wasn't just like any messenger, that was a divine messenger. So as far as we can tell, you know, it's all ancient cultures believed in these messengers who sometimes came from the heavens, right? Amazing. Different way of thinking of your of your mail delivery person. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is a somewhat tough question as there isn't really a decisive answer, but where do we think that the conception of angels came from originally? Yeah. So I tried to think about how to answer this question. I think the problem is I can't go back in time to the archaeological or written record and find a time when people didn't believe in a really populated divine realm, right? Every origin story, even if it starts with a unitary figure, quickly becomes about a very uh, crowded, invisible realm. 
So I think all ancient peoples believed in a populated divine realm. What changes over time, especially in the Hellenistic period, is that these divine messengers become more responsive to ordinary people. So that's one of the few changes you can really see kind of happening over the course of a Hellenistic period. Okay, cool. And the, because I hear a lot of people saying that it's it's Zoroastrian or, or, or it's Babylonian. Is there some credence no. to these these things? I mean, all of those um, religions also right, had angelic figures and gods. And from what we can tell, they were originally responsive to the rulers and the monarchs. And what we see in early biblical texts is, is somewhat of like a democratization. Like, you know, the priests, of course, are very important. You still have these hierarchies, but slowly the concepts of, of holiness, of God paying attention um, to lowly people like that, those stories seem to grow and catch it. Like that's what becomes really important uh, to people. So we can we can say like, oh, I see elements in Zoroastrianism. I see elements in Babylonianism. Like these names must have come from Babylonia. So like, yes, all of these elements are around um, but I think it's really hard to say like this is the this pinpoint, this moment, this time, this place, this culture is the origin because it's these things really grow organically, um, you know, with with different interpreters. Amazing. I love mm -hmm. I love that answer. That's that's a really good one. So yes, people, angels do not come from one thing specifically. We have to think about over large, large swaths of time how these these beliefs come into effect and it's not as simple as everybody wants to make it uh, but how did angels make their way into early judaism okay so it's, <laughs> i'll answer the question this way what, what what do we mean when we talk about early judaism i think in my field most of us agree that we can start talking about early judaism after the babylonian conquest and return right so we're talking like fifth century bce really when we have the Torah, right, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, that's when we can talk about early Judaism. And if you look at the stories of Genesis, right, they're right there in the first creation story. Right? So Genesis, even though it's chapter two, verse one, it's the end of the first textual story, textual unit in the Hebrew Bible, right? So we have this, this verse like, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their multitudes. Who are the multitudes of the heavens, right? <laughs> they aren't just like the birds and such, right? These are um, the the angelic multitudes of the heavens. So it's a very like you could like read it quickly and you'll miss it, but it's very clear that God created um, the multitudes. Now, of course, Christians like Augustine will like say, well, actually, maybe when light was created, that's where we see angelic creation, right? With the creation of the primordial light. Those answers are possible like and jews also kind of knew about them um they're not as obsessed with like <laughs> answering this question um as, as some christians are in their attempts to create a systemic theology they certainly seem to be there from the beginning and then the, then the second creation story about adam and eve of course you have after the expulsion of the first humans you have the cherubim stationed with the flaming sword right at the exit to Eden. So that's kind of another like, clearly like a divine guardian figure, clearly inspired by like ancient Assyrian art, but also clearly some sort of angelic figure. Definitely. So they're they're right there from the first creation stories. Yeah. And as a term that people might come across, and perhaps I just need to, to put a pin in this mm -hmm. one, when they talk about hosts, the host of heaven, that yeah, a lot of times they're right. talking about angels, right? So that's the angels. Exactly. Because how can you have you know, an all-powerful God if he doesn't have right this multitude of hosts? And I should say, like, so, you know, I, I mentioned the two stories in Genesis, but equally important is like Genesis 6 when the, the sons of God mate with the daughters of man, right? They produce the, the Nephilim. The Nephilim, <laughs> right? yes. <laughs> uh, right, so that's that's the origin of the myth of the fallen angels. Very important myth, we'll probably circle back to. The angels, of course, appear to Abraham. It looks like just three strangers, um, right? They intervene to save Isaac when he's almost, you know, at the binding of Isaac. An angel of God leads the Israelites through the wilderness. I mean, Isaiah sees Seraphim in the throne room, Ezekiel sees them. Um, I do want to mention Hagar, right? Hagar, when she's expelled by uh, you know Abraham and Sarah, like she's in the wilderness and an angel, you know, intervenes and saves her. So we have these really cosmic stories, but we also have these very individual uh, stories about people in need of, of angelic intervention. 
definitely. You brought up this uh, imagery of a flaming sword, and this is something that you will come across, say, on uh, in the realms of Twitter and people posting pictures of what's called biblically accurate angels. And of course, yes. there's wings and eyes and wheels and all of this kind of stuff. But what are some of the earliest conceptualizations oh, yeah. of angels' appearances and, and how did angels manifest in, in early Jewish culture? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I think that the obsession with the appearance of angels is definitely a more modern preoccupation than an ancient one. Like, I don't okay. see ancient texts as worried about this. They were like, well, obviously the invisible realm <laughs> has angels. But still, you know, we can say that, uh, like I said, sometimes people conceptual like believe that angels could pass as human. Isaiah does mention, right, that the seraphim has six wings. Ezekiel sees all sorts of <laughs> otherworldly creatures. When he does mention the number of their wings, he does say four. I, I do love the biblically accurate angel yeah, um, sure. meme. Because it, I mean what it does, like what is true <laughs> about it is that the changeability of angels was taken for granted. By ancient people like that that is one thing i think that all ancient jews agreed on and there's very few things i can say that all ancient jews agreed on but they agreed that angels were made of fire and that they could change appearance and, and actually the the turning flaming sword that the turning for some reason that really made them think about how god could turn angels from fire into wind into a form that looked mortal masculine feminine you know etc so that changeability, I think, was key to angelic appearance. I should mention one more thing. What does change, again, Hellenistic era after Alexander the Great, is that the Greek imagination of the two-winged messenger just becomes so dominant mm -hmm. that it ends up shifting the way that Jews conceptualize angels. And, and that's and that becomes the way Christians conceptualize angels, too. For sure. And Muslims. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So how were angels understood by ancient Jewish culture? You, you said the word messenger, which is very important, but mm -hmm. did they do other things? Did they have specific duties or callings? Yeah. So again, like no singular definitions. Um, as many roles as you can think of, angels can do. Um, I mean, of course, the most popular one is conveying the prayers of humans to God. So right, they're the kind of the messenger, the bridging of the earthly and heavenly realms but they could also you know there's also the angels nations right michael is the the prince the angelic prince of the people of israel and clearly every other nations right persia they also have their angelic princes so there's some sort of like as people are fighting here in the mortal realm their angels are fighting in the cosmic realm so it's like the national figure of the angel there's also the familial angels right the angels that guard the family you see that in the book of tobit we have angels that guard individuals. You know, the idea of a of a good angel and bad angel on your shoulder is also a pretty ancient idea. Like, I think in my book, I talk about as, as early as like second century uh, CE that we see it among Jews and, and Christians. You know, the angels can encourage you towards good. The angel of evil can also encourage you towards, towards transgression. Right. <laughs> um, so they can help you with your business, your marriage your life, right? Like you can see how this sort of sounds like responding to prayer. Right. Um, but but they can also do things that are kind of on a national scale. I think there's something funny there. They seem to be fond of breaking people out of prison for some strange reason. Oh, yeah. That is, <laughs> you know, angels are there when all the other authority figures in your life have failed you. Right. And I think that's their appeal. For sure. Yeah. One of the things that is absolutely amazing uh, within your book, I knew about mm -hmm. these beforehand, but you make it very clear about how important these are to our early angelic understandings, are these archaeological artifacts, which are called incantation bowls. So yeah. what are these and why are these magical objects so important to our early angelic understandings? Yeah, I was really excited when I discovered these. So uh Incantation bowls are like, they can be just about the size of a cereal bowl. They can be much bigger. They can be smaller, but most of them are about the size of a cereal bowl. They're very, honestly, kind of cheap, <laughs> cheap ceramic bowls. And you have to remember that writing on ceramics was pretty common in the ancient world, especially before the invention of paper, which doesn't happen until like the ninth century. 
So people are writing on ceramics, usually broken ceramics, right? Hence our right. word ostracized, ostracon from the Greek context. Oh. Um, it's like fun fact. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but for some reason, between the 4th century CE or AD in uh, Mesopotamia and about the 7th century, so, you know, I don't know, about a 400, 300, 400 year period, people were inscribing bulls in a spiral uh, with ink and they were calling on angels, on God, sometimes on a ritual practitioner, sometimes on the biblical patriarchs to help them in their everyday life. Now, what's mystified archaeologists is why this phenomenon is limited to Mesopotamia. This is like Iraq and Iran, and why most of the bulls discovered have been written in Jewish Aramaic. Now, there's also some in Syriac, also in Mandean, a few discovered in Persian, and even in Arabic. So they are in many languages, but most of them <laughs> appear to have been written by Jews. And when Jewish scholars first kind of were starting to translate this, and they, they were kind of embarrassed about it, frankly, <laughs> uh, because it seems like so superstitious. What are these magic bulls calling on? And, you know, they're, they're, they are so, somewhat formulaic, but it wasn't what they expect. If you're expecting to, like, dig in, you know, ancient Nippur and discover evidence of Jews, you want to find something about the rabbis. You don't want to find like this weird magical stuff. Right. And so they would they would say stuff like, okay, well, they were written by Jewish specialists, but clearly they were written for non-Jews because Jews, no, they would never engage in this magical stuff, <laughs> <laughs> which I just find really apologetic and silly. Yeah. Like, so what's important about these, that's your kind of original question, is that they get us to what people were doing in their everyday lives. And the way they were relating to the angelic realm and their everyday lives. And that's not something that's always easy to see with rabbinic texts or liturgical texts, right? Because the texts of the, the rabbis are highly edited and they're trying to like portray a certain kind of Judaism, right? That they value. Right. But but the rabbis were a minority in their own time, right? And rabbinic Judaism doesn't become normative until much later. In the medieval period, I usually tell my students like 1100 CE, mm -hmm. you know, in Europe, so it's much later. So for the first 1000 years of Judaism in the common era, Judaism looked very different. And the incantation bowls allow us to see just like in like Nippur, this happens to be an ancient city where like several dozen of these were found, just a slice, I think, of life. And I find that really beautiful and fascinating. Um, I just, I, you see families represented, like women's voices, like men's prayers, like it's just, I think it's important to our understanding of angels, uh, but it's even more important to our understanding of common people and what and how they imagine the world. For sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, please definitely mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but were some of these bowls used with uh, using the names of angels and then they would be buried upside down in order to trap spirits or in demons and things like that? Is that is that part of the mechanics of the use of these bowls? Yeah. So it's kind of one of the, one of the things that are still somewhat debated is how do these bowls actually work? And some of the bowls do start with the words like covered, you are covered, you are bound. That does seem to suggest that they're right, right. covering or trying to bind the angels in place in their home. Okay. You know, one of my colleagues, uh, David Frankfurter at Boston University, he uh, he thinks that like, you know, the way you kind of like trap a scorpion under a bowl, <laughs> like yeah, that's nice. like you kind of trap a demon. <laughs> it's like, it's totally possible. I mean, what's interesting is that there's so much variation in, in the bowls and some of them do talk about kind of binding and trapping, but some of them are a lot more like prayers and invocations or like trying to imagine scenarios, trying to kind of paint a picture of the, the world you actually do want to be in. So they have different strategies and techniques. I think that's it. what I'm getting at. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So where did the angels stand in conceptions of like morality? Because we tend to think of like all angels being good, except for the fallen ones, but we'll yeah. talk about those later. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but, but how did angels stand in good and evil? Were they, were they amoral or were, was there some kind of a binary with them? Oh, that's a good question. So I think in, in my book, I ended up saying that like angels tend to, they're always in alignment with divine will. 
Now, Isaiah in the Hebrew Bible tells us that God created weal and woe, right? Well-being and suffering. This is a little bit hard for Christians <laughs> sometimes to take, but everything according to the, the prophets, right, comes from God. And that means you need angels of good, and you also have angels of evil, right? Sometimes they're called angels of destruction. Sometimes what I talk about in my book is, is angels that monitor good and angels that monitor evil. Um, and I think when you think about the angels of evil, they can sort of be like the policemen of the okay. divine realm. They're like, you know, writing speeding tickets. They're like right. <laughs> counting up all the things that you have done wrong so that when you die, they can be like, okay, this is what, you know, Douglas did in his lifetime. You know, should we persecute right. him? Like, <laughs> oh, um, so you don't want to, you don't want to like mess with the angels of evil, right? you know, but, but they're around, they're everywhere. And ancient Jews did try to protect themselves from angels of evil as well as demons. They're considered separately. There's not the people sometimes because of Dan Brown. Everybody's like, oh, angels and demons. But like, no, there's like angels of good, angels of evils, and they're demons. <laughs> there's three categories. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I want people to really sit with that and, and think about that. But uh, it's it's incredible, mm-hmm. and and you really do go into it quite well uh, in in your book. So well worth looking into for everybody. I'd like to change gears here and talk a little bit about the, uh, and I'm putting really big quotes around this, uh, the mythology of of Mm -hmm. angels in Judaism. So there's a debate, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but there's a debate about angels created. Were they created during the act of creation or were they created before creation? So what what do you make of this? I I think from a a Jewish perspective, perspective like and i guess i'm thinking about the, the literature i'm familiar with i mean it's a little ambiguous ambiguous but they're definitely present by the end of the first creation story so okay. i would say like during creation like i mean you know jews like to say like that the torah you know maybe was <laughs> pre-existed to creation right. and god created the world through the torah right. but um yeah i think i don't see jews too preoccupied i mean there, and there's a lot of like if we look at the, right, the christian world like was Jesus pre-existent with God, co-existent with God? Like, you don't have that as much of that um, worry. Although maybe they'll be like, is it on the fourth day? Is it on the sixth day? Right. It's it's interesting that the rabbis comment on the creation of demons in their first important text, the Mishnah, okay. around 200 CE. They're very clear that demons were created at twilight on the sixth day. Oh, yeah, which I think is super interesting. And they're <laughs> yeah. and they're called mazikin. In the, in the rabbinic text, the rabbis don't comment on angels. And I think they do this on purpose because they feel like people pay too much attention to the angels. <laughs> we'll talk about this in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did God create the angels through, through the stories? I mean, uh, one of my favorite is, is this, there's this idea, and it might be a little bit later, but it's this mm-hmm. idea that he breathed them into existence. Is this something that you, you come across? Yeah. So I think in the Psalms, it says that right, uh, God created the angels as like a wind and fire as his messengers yeah so like there's this in that sense that that and this is something that remains very influential like again few things that jews agree on angels are created of fire and wind so right and, and you see that also interestingly in um, islamic thought as well so there's a really um lovely rabbinic um a lot of rabbinic speculation that I discuss in, in my chapter on, on the rabbis, and they one of the stories is that they're created from like a river of fire. Awesome. But then they're also like <laughs> that they return to this river uh, of fire. Uh, but yeah, but you are right that uh, later Jewish mystics, in particular, said that it's not just that God creates an angel with every uh, one of His utterances; it's that even like a person can create an angel with every one of his utterances. He sort of can manifest them into being. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So the way angels are created kind of changes over time too. That's awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. Something that you talked about earlier were, were cherubim and seraphim. Now seraphim yeah. are one of those ones that speaking of fire, mm-hmm. the word, correct me if I'm wrong, the word seraphim is, is from the word serpent. Is it not? So is that right? Or yeah. is that... No, you're right. There's it's an ancient uh, Egyptian. There's an ancient Egyptian cognate there, and in, in Hebrew, I, I'm not completely sure of the etymology, but I 
thought I addressed it somewhere. I know my colleague Scott Nagel for sure did the study on this. Okay. <laughs> <Sorry to laughs> go back. I refresh my memory, but um, Hebrew saraf is also related to the word for fire. Burning. Um, exactly. It's like the burning uh, serpent figure. Uh, so that does seem to be from an Egyptian context, whereas the cherubim are from the Mesopotamian context. That's like, I remember one of the main takeaways there we go. <laughs> from that article. And again, right, the ancient Jews are kind of right in the middle of this context between Egypt and Mesopotamia. So they have influences from both that influence the way that they imagine the divine realm. What makes the cherubim and cherubim different than angels? Or is there is there something distinct that makes them different? So different function, right? So cherubim, when they show up, are guardian figures, right? Like we said, with the flaming sword. If you look at ancient Mesopotamian art, they have a lot of these um, somewhat polymorphic divine figures, right? They always have wings, but they can have the faces of different animals, right? They're like these hybrid animal uh, human creatures. Actually, in the Book of Kings, in the description of the Temple of Solomon, there's a description of the walls, the decorated walls of the temple, and they have the cherubim framing sacred trees, which people like don't expect. They're like, what? I mean, there was, right? They expect aniconism, right? right. Like they expect lack of images, but it's it's not true. Like ancient Jews, like all ancient people had a very rich um, imagination um, and wanted to decorate their sacred spaces. So there were images of cherubim inside of the first temple. Maybe not the second temple, um, <laughs> hard to know, uh, but definitely inside the first temple. And there was a sense that the, of course, if God's presence is in the throne room in the temple, he's going to have, um, you know, guardian figures attest, uh, attending him. Now, why did Isaiah then imagine seraphim with the six wings? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, if you look at that, that, that image, that, that story of Isaiah uh, chapter 6 is really important uh, to ancient people. It's really it's Isaiah's calling, right? It's how he really begins his prophetic work. And the right there is this moment where like coal is brought to his lips to burn them and cleanse them. So there does seem to be like a sort of a theme of like fire and cleansing. And maybe that's what brought the seraphim to his mind rather than the, the cherubim. Oh, that's my my best answer. <laughs> I love it. No, that that's great. That's wonderful. The angels themselves, uh, mm -hmm. Michael, Gabriel, Gabriel, yeah. Michael, Gabriel. These are very interesting names. How did these names come about, and and what's with the uh, the suffix yeah. "l" on on the end of most angel names? Yes, yeah, so of course. Um, there's two common names for God in the Torah. The first one we encounter in the first creation story is Elohim, right? The, 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 you know, the one on high, I guess, the, right. the, the elevated one. So, right, so El um, becomes like a shortened suffix, the short for Elohim. And of course, um, the other one, right, which is taboo to pronounce um, in Judaism. <laughs> um, I'll just, I'll say it because it, to my mind, it's such a like a mispronunciation that I'm very far from the originally, but but like like a Yahweh thing, mm -hmm. and that also gives us the Yah kind of suffix. So like my last name, Ahuvi Yah, right? It's like right. it has Ahuv and Yah. So <laughs> so El or Yah are like two suffixes that refer to God, and it was very common. You know, many ancient names involve parts of the name of of God. Um, so. It makes sense that when people were trying were inventing angel names, they either used El or Ya, or sometimes they did they used neither. People invented angels' names all the time as right. necessary. Yeah. <laughs> I should say my, my my teacher Peter Schaefer wrote the the origins of Jewish mysticism. I think I already said that uh, years ago. So I just want to give him credit for, <laughs> for sure. saying that. Yeah. The earliest that we see these names, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, um, is in um, the book of the watchers or what comes to be collected in first enoch this is probably a text from you know, the third century bce so it, it's interesting that it's kind of outside the, the hebrew bible actually of course the book of daniel you do have michael and gabriel but book of daniel is probably from 164 bce um, and then the book of tobit gives us raphael and the book of tobit is probably 200 bce or maybe a little bit earlier. So it is 
you know, these are book of Daniel is very suspect um, by the ancient rabbis. So like almost didn't make it into the canon, I think. I love it. Right, the, book, the, book. the book of Daniel is my favorite. <laughs> I love the book of Daniel from Belshazzar's feast. It's the best. I, I just enjoy yeah. that. But it's interesting, right? So in the Christian Bible, Daniel is like listed among the prophets. Right. In the Jewish Bible, he's in the writing section. So right. <laughs> like, he's a little bit demoted um, in, in the Hebrew <laughs> Bible, but but of course, but yeah, it is. I, I, and again, I think that speaks to the kind of like a little bit liminal position of angels, mm -hmm. right? Like Michael, Gabriel, Raphael are very important to. Um, early Jews, but they're just they're 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 late compared mm -hmm. to the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Definitely. Yeah. You talked about the the Book of Enoch, so I want to talk a yeah. bit more about this. Why is this a very important book for our understanding of angels? And there's a book in there oh. called the Book of the Watchers. So what is that? It's a two part yeah. question. So what are yeah. these things? <laughs> so um, so the second part first. The Watchers are the ones who are always watching God. Right. These are. A type of, of angels and apparently that was the according to the book the role of the angels was to attend god right to watch god to be um, in his presence um and the book of the watchers gives us a really short and powerful myth it basically elaborates on genesis 6 um, 1 through 4 right that story i mentioned of the um, sons of god and the daughters of man very nice. cryptic verses so it's unclear actually what came first. Did the Genesis verses come first or did this myth come first? Like is right. the Genesis short story trying to like close off a mystery? And is the Book of the Watchers trying to like unravel it? Like unclear. But Book of the Watchers tells us in much more expanded form about a naughty group of angels who decide to depart their stations and come down to earth and teach humanity about medicine about weapons of war about cosmetics for women <laughs> all sorts of interesting things metallurgy all of the good exactly. stuff. exactly yeah yeah all of this you know knowledge that you know it, it it's suspect right because the metallurgy especially right it, it's um it could be it created war and chaos upon the earth right and the mating of angels and women apparently produced giants upon the earth. And these the, the chaos and havoc created by these giants right, causes people to cry out to God for help. And then God sends the archangels. Right. And I don't think the word archangels is quite in the book of um, in the book of the watchers. It's in a later um, Enochic text, but we do that's where we see um either I think a foursome or sometimes it's seven, depends on that which version of the Book of the Watchers you read. You do see Michael and Gabriel and Raphael. Like they are they're gonna go down and destroy these giants. And they can destroy the giants' bodies, but they can't destroy their souls. And these souls are the demons that are present upon the earth and are hungering. They're they're hungering, you know, to feed themselves um, and they're hungering for bodies. Hence demonic possession, hence the annoying things that demons do to interrupt ancient life. Right. Um, but this is, it's a really powerful myth. And I got to tell you that like early Jewish and Christian leaders hate it <laughs> <laughs> because it places the, you know, the source of the world's problems in something that the angels did, not right. something that the humans did. Yeah. So if you're a priest or a rabbi or a specialist, you want to like, you want to make humans responsible for what happens. You don't want to like blame cosmic issues. But the thing is, once you have this, once this story is in the air, it cannot be suppressed. Right. And it's really fascinating that people don't realize it was, you know, originally like, like it's a very Jewish story, Yeah. you know, and now it's just, now it's like people who don't know anything about the Bible know about like they know that there are these fallen angels. It's really fascinating. So yeah. the leader of the fallen angel slash watcher, the name mm -hmm. you might come across is Semyaza. I'm probably pronouncing that, yeah. that, that incorrectly. Yeah, I think it's like it's Shimi Chaza. What were the motives? And and why is this fall such a huge thing? You mentioned that it was like once it's out in the open, it's like it puts the onus on somewhat divine entities. So 
Uh, what does the yeah. story of the fall tell us more? Like, how does it expand the story of the angels? If you read the story very closely, there's actually two different stories that are woven together, which right. is very common in our biblical text. In one story, the angels like themselves that just are like, hey, let's go down to earth. And the second one, women are blamed for seducing the angels. Yeah. Of course. Why not? Right. right. <laughs> Um, so what what it like where did this story come from? Um, so I think there's two really interesting explanations, maybe three explanations. One is that it's that it's an attempt to explain the arrival of the armies of Alexander the Great as they go through the ancient Middle East. Like it's just such a shock, like a culture shock right. to people that there's almost a sense of like, are these like, you know, is there some otherworldly designed occurrence so like, like that's probably one cultural background another kind of popular explanation is that um this is actually a critique of ancient jewish priests who were marrying women uh who were outside priestly clans or outside the jewish people and there was like like worry about mixing of like blood lineages kind of annoying mm -hmm. explanation right a third explanation I find actually really fun is that um, ancient people would occasionally dig up bones, including dinosaur bones. And they were like, what are these? And as they attempted to rearrange these skeletons into something that looked like human bones, they were like, oh, they were ancient giants. <laughs> Where do the giants come from? <laughs> and huh. so that the myth of the fallen angels is just an attempt to explain this, like uh, natural phenomena. So I hope that like answers your question, like where does this come <laughs> from? Um, there's all sorts of possibilities. Right. <laughs> um, but it does, it did serve to explain to some people. It was a more convincing explanation to some people of why there was, why is it that bad things happen in a world created by God? For sure. I love it. Love that answer. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned Alexander the Great and Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. his conquering of Persia as well as Egypt and and uh, the, the Near yeah. East was an enormous occasion. And so it kicked off what is called uh, the Hellenistic Age or the Hellenistic Era. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that stories and myths of angels flourished during this period of time? So it starts, I would say the, the flourishing of the story starts a little bit, it does say in the Persian period, it does grow in the Hellenistic period. And I think it's because um, of the emergence of scribes, like the, the rising importance of scribes, right? Enoch himself is described as a scribe. So you have like the first, like, you know, before that we've had kings, we've had prophets, <laughs> And you had like a court recorder, you know, like the court secretary, right? <laughs> you know, so suddenly these court secretaries, these scribes, um, they're becoming like a much more important profession for communicating across huge distances in these massive empires. So I think it's, it's, it shouldn't be surprising that this starts a bit in the Persian period, because obviously the Persian empire is massive, but um, even more so in the Hellenistic period in the, in the massive Hellenistic um, empire that encourages trade um, that encourages a certain kind of Hellenistic learning. Of course, you have ongoing conflicts between the successors of Alexander. You also have um, Jews who sign up to be the Alexander's armies, maybe some Jews that are also enslaved, but you suddenly have Jews far beyond um, their their ancestral homeland and even beyond Babylonia, right? Because you had you had some exiles in Babylonia, some in the ancient Israel, but now you have them all over the Greek Empire. Two angels that we've talked about, and they're they're in the uh, mm -hmm. the title of your book. Uh, that would be Mikhail, Michael, and and Gabriel. Gabriel. Yeah. Did they have earlier precedence than when they are first mentioned in Enoch and 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 Tobit and and the Book of Tobit and Daniel? Or do you think they go back a little bit further? Or is that where they kind of like? They must have it. Yeah. So it, it's a really, there's an interesting tendency in late antiquity to want to name previously unnamed figures. Okay. Or to put together a figure that's unnamed with a figure that's named. You know, I think I always like err on the side of like, 
we can never know. Right. <laughs> you know, like it's just like it's unknowable right. ultimately. But like when Michael is first named, his name is the prince of the people of Israel, right? Sal in Hebrew. Is Michael the same one as the angel of the Lord in Exodus that leads the people out of Egypt? Right. I don't know. Maybe for <laughs> some Jews he, he was. You know, Gabriel is a fascinating figure, you know, because, you know, he he's communicating with um, Daniel and, right, he, he has the appearance of a man, right, hence the, the, the godly L, um, and, and he becomes the, like, the archetypal messenger angel, right? That's why Gabriel communicates with Mary. That's why Gabriel communicates with Muhammad. So, you know, the first appearance is really important to what the later imaginings are. And then when people are looking to kind of connect the dots, they can go back and say, oh, maybe this was an earlier appearance when this figure isn't named. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The title of your book and this will be familiar to a lot of people that listen to my podcasts, Michael on my right, Gabriel on my left. That is from, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the Shema prayer, is it? the nighttime Shema. Shema, Shema sorry, yes. Mm-hmm. Prayer. What is this idea of trying to call the angels uh, on all sides? What is that about? Yeah, yeah. so this is like a, a theme in my book that I kind of tracked across many chapters. Interestingly, some of our, our earliest kind of references to, to this imagery because it's it's you know angel, it's michael on my right gabriel on my left but there's also like an angel in front of me an angel behind me and the shrina right the movements of god above me we find some of the earliest instantiations of that formula in incantation bowls and yeah. in several languages which is amazing yeah. <laughs> right and so like sometimes people say you know i said to people and they're like wait does that mean it's not jewish and i'm like no, I mean, really great ideas tend to travel <laughs> across right. cultures and languages. And there's something really comforting about this image of being surrounded by angels on all sides. So in my book, like I I do find some some early kind of rabbinic um, midrashim or interpretations that sort of imagine the people of Israel surrounded by the clouds of God. Oh like both on their on their four sides beneath them above them and I was like is this an earlier like form of that idea maybe it's hard to say it's possible that it came you know out of interpretation of a biblical story that it went into the ritual incantation and magic and that from there it came into the fixed prayer and and then what's called the, like the nighttime shema so observant Jews to this day and apparently as early as the ninth century probably were invoking the angels on all sides as they went to sleep at night to protect them. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Very good. (laughs) Definitely. So so I'm just going to say this to the listeners. So remember the thing called the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Uh, You might need to look into this nighttime uh, shame. It's it's really quite, uh, quite amazing. We're going to switch gears here to, uh, to something that a lot of people make a, a big deal of because, and I mean this without any disrespect, because it sounds like a transformer. So, oh yeah, <laughs> Metatron. Metatron. Totally. I've mm-hmm. always wanted to ask this question to a guest, but what is going on with Metatron? <laughs> okay, let's start with the word, the name. Sure, <laughs> sure. There's two possible explanations. One is from the Greek metathronos, right? Okay. Metathron, like someone who serves beside or behind the divine throne, or it's from the Latin metator which is a Roman officer who acts as a forerunner. Okay, so the name has something to do with someone that kind of secondary or coming ahead. Menetron <laughs> seems to arise kind of in the eighth century. He suddenly just like coalesces, like he's like a co- conglomerate of many earlier conceptualizations of angels. And some people think that he is a Jewish response to like a Jesus figure, okay. one that's second to God, but it's like, and I'm putting it in more palatable Jewish terms. But it's, it's very 
hard to like like he he sucks up so much like passionate energy right like, like responding to oh jesus but he's also like according to this like medieval text called three enoch like he's actually the biblical patriarch enoch that we talked about earlier you know right. with the scribe and the fallen angels yeah so he like just sucks up so much imaginative energy in the medieval right. period um and i will say i think the definitive exposition on the Metatron traditions can be found in my colleague Yakir Paz's article, okay. uh, which is called Metatron is not Enoch, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but he traces all the traditions. And like, that's the place if you, if you want to find every single tradition associated with Metatron, that's a good place to look. If you have access to a library, I did, um, there is a, what's called the encyclopedia of biblical reception. Okay. And you can find how Metatron appears in many different periods of Jewish literature, but also Islamic literature. So that could be like a fun place to, to look if you have access to a library or you can just email me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. One of the things that I think was most shocking to me in, in your book mm -hmm. is that there was this early insistence of the rabbinic thought to try and curb Jews from imitating angels as opposed to, to imitating God. They would say, like, mm -hmm. don't take your cues from the angels, take your yeah. cues from God. Why do you think that this happened and, and why were they saying this? I, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about angels is that in some of the earliest discussions um, of angels and like the book of Deuteronomy, for example, uh, right, book of Deuteronomy has uh, many has many law collections, legal collections, and one of them states, you know, the stars of the heavens, right, all the celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, they're for other people to worship. They're not for you, ancient Israel, right? Because right. you belong to God alone. And I should say, right, we've talked about angels as fire, right? Stars were perceived as angels mm -hmm. um, as well. So. I, I find that really interesting because it suggests that there is this tension between like belief in God and preoccupation with angels. And it seems to me that the rabbis, you know, the early kind of figures, or we we'll call them the sages in the first and second century, the people of Israel had just experienced um, a century of trauma, <laughs> of, uh, of war, enslavement, displacement. And they could very well have said, you know, maybe this covenant we have with God is over. And so for sages, it was really important to emphasize that, like, no, like God still loves you and is concerned about you and is faithful to you. And as much as possible, they were trying to emphasize this permanent relationship. And I think, as I've said, like, right when authorities fail you, you turn to the angels. Right. I think, they, I think there was a sense that, like, many people were, were turning to, like, these, like, lesser figures and i think the, the rabbis are really worried about that because it's clear that ancient jews were really into angels if you look at the fixed jewish liturgy today right the it's called the amidah it's like 18 part prayer the third part is about god's holiness but it suddenly switches to <laughs> basically quoting isaiah and the holy 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 right um, it's if you look at the structure of the prayer, it, it it's really it stands it doesn't make sense. But apparently it was so important to people to imitate the way that the angels prayed to God, according to Isaiah, that it became part of the liturgy. So people were like they wanted to know that the angels were with them. You know, it was really important to them. And, and we see this like in even like in the fifth and sixth century among Jews and Christians, like both Jews and Christians are claiming that the angels are in spaces of worship with them. So the rabbis at first, like they, in the earlier period, I think they're a little bit concerned about this, but by like the sixth century, they're like, Oh, fine. You believe <laughs> you love the angels. Let's just like, listen, this is how you should do Shabbat. Right. You should do, you should prepare for Shabbat in this way because the angels are watching you. Like they just completely like sort of flip the script. They're like, okay, can't beat them. Let's just, <laughs> let's just, let's just use them to, to make sure Jews are good Jews. Right. You can't keep the angels down. That, that's amazing. I love that. 
I have to ask because I know a lot of people that have not actually gone through the the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible at all. They think that the angels are all throughout the Old Testament, and they might be surprised that they're, there's not in there quite a bit. There seems to be a real lack of them in there. So why do you think that there's not as much as should be expected, and particularly through things like the prophetic books of the Old Testament? Well, you know, I thought this was a really interesting question because, right, the clearly the angels are in Isaiah, yep. they are in Ezekiel, they are in Zechariah. But at the same time, like the prophets themselves are messengers of God. Mm. So it makes sense that they don't talk about the angels quite as much. But, you know, I do tell my students, like, you know, when, when we're reading texts, like if you just, if you go from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament, it can seem really jarring mm-hmm. because the representations of angels in like the gospel stories are so vivid. Yeah. So what's going on there? So, I mean, in part, we have shifted culture, genre, and language, right? We've gone from 6th century BCE Hebrew texts to, you know, second, late, late first, second century Greek texts. And this is just, it's a different, it's a completely different, like, style and way of writing. And Eric Auerbach's Mimesis has a really beautiful chapter where he compares them um, a chapter of the Odyssey with the binding of Isaac. Okay. And he talks about like the power of Hebrew, of biblical Hebrew texts is in um, it's all like in foreground and background. It's like the way biblical authors tell a story is like a stage that's black with a spotlight, you know, on the right. main figures. Like the all the details are kind of left in the background for you to fill in and imagine. Like that's the power of a biblical story. And that's kind of the way angels are portrayed. Like they're very sparse and spare. Then you turn to the Odyssey or the Iliad and the Greeks are like, let me just pile detail upon detail. <laughs> you know, right? let, me, let me tell you about like this, you know, go on for chapters about the encounter of Odysseus and his dog when he comes home after 20 right. years. Like it's just a totally different style. And like, that's what you're seeing when you shift from the biblical stories of angels to the New Testament period, all the ingredients are already there in the Hebrew Bible, right? The people who wrote the New Testament were probably Jewish themselves. They were deeply influenced by Jewish scriptures. So they're just, they're just telling stories like right from a few hundred years after the biblical text and their style reflects that. Very, yeah, very vivid stuff for sure. The mistake a lot of people make is that they go from the New Testament into read, or sorry, the Old Testament into reading the New Testament, just kind of like considering it being like the same style and it's yeah. not. They're vastly different. But um, and they skip over like all the inter, you know, the, the text that came in between, right? Like the right. book of the watchers, like first Enoch. Like there's so many texts in between there that actually you kind of would see that bridging yeah. of the two worlds more more clearly if you if you read those texts. Definitely. Yeah. What role do angels play in the emergence of, of Jewish mysticism? Big question. <laughs> it is a big question. We don't have to, we're, that's a, it's a whole, it yeah. could be a whole episode, truthfully. Yeah, whole episode. Yeah. Um, so there is a book called The Origins of Jewish Mysticism by my teacher, Peter Schaefer, which I'll recommend. Um, but most people trace Jewish mysticism back to Ezekiel and Ezekiel's vision of the throne of God departing from the temple. Again, right? Like, you're looking for the most otherworldly <laughs> depiction or just, you know, the most weird, bizarre, supernatural discussion of the Bible. Obviously, Ezekiel is the book for you. Yeah. <laughs> I do not believe, I just want to be very clear. I do not see any aliens in this book. Okay. okay. All right. Good. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> people often ask me about whether Ezekiel is seeing aliens. I'm like, no. Okay. I think <laughs> it's, it's a UFO. It has to be. I know we don't we don't need aliens to explain what's going on in the Bible, no, people. No, no. <laughs> um, but um, Jewish mystical speculation does go back to um, Ezekiel, and what I discuss um, in my book and in, in the last chapter is this genre of, of literature about um, the heavenly palaces, which became very popular, perhaps around the fifth and sixth century perhaps with Jews adjacent to the rabbinic class who were not rabbis themselves and were felt excluded. And in the imagination of these mystics, they could access the angels. They could access divine knowledge. The angels could give them mastery over Torah. 
but the angels could also give them mastery over other human beings in some mm-hmm. cases <laughs> but for some these the secrets that the angels could give them were really just how to access um the heavenly realms right the seven layers of heaven get through the gatekeepers and achieve liturgical union with the angels right they so the ultimate objectives was to be among the angels close to god so it's a really fascinating mystical genre i will say it's it ends up going out of style right kabbalah is the right <laughs> the jewish mysticism that becomes popular uh, much later uh, but if you are interested kind of in an early form of jewish mysticism that kind of really remained subterranean the Hechelot mysticism that i discuss in my book um, and yeah. I'll tell you about the role of angels. Yeah, definitely. And, and really, that this is where when like angelic speculation really, I think, reaches zenith among Jews. It's just <laughs> hard to overestimate how important angels became to these early mystics. Yeah, we've already talked a little bit about uh, the the New Testament. What was the conception of angels? in the emergence of what we're going to call Christianity, did they just mm-hmm. basically take wholesale from the Jewish conceptions of angels at the time? I mean, yeah, I've, I've mentioned the example of Gabriel, right? The the host, the angelic host uh, kind of um, acknowledges Jesus' appearance. You uh, have some early conceptions of testing um, of Jesus with the angels. I, I mean, I see, you see, I think, a lot of ingredients in the Hebrew Bible also in the New Testament. And again, it's because right, these early evangelists were trying to to draw on this deep well of traditions to persuade a Jewish audience, but also a, a non-Jewish audience that Jesus was foreshadowed in scripture. So leaning on these ancient traditions uh, was helpful to that endeavor. How widespread was the belief in angels by say the fourth century because there's something that it's not explicit but there might have been cults that formed around the worship of angels there's yeah. the council of Laodicea in, in 363 which basically forbade angel worship so yeah. would this indicate to us that these things actually existed yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's something that's and it's probably being done. I should mention that um, the emperor who was uh, an apostate, Justin? Julian. Julian, thank you. Julian. Pregnancy brain. Um, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, um, in his writings, describes um, the angelic guardians of cities. So I think like that, I, I mentioned, right, angels of nations, families, individuals. But of course, the city is very important in the kind of Greek imagination. And so something I've been meaning to, to research a little bit more, more deeply is that we have archaeological evidence, you know, for Michael um, and Gabriel and other angels seen as the defenders of cities outside of a Jewish and Greek context, right? That means like... Angels were popular then not just among Jews and Christians, but among polytheists, like traditional Roman polytheists were calling on angels. And we have Egyptian magic that shows that they were, Michael and Gabriel have become, like have transcended their Jewish and Christian background and have become this like seen as powerful divinities in the Mediterranean world. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting to think about again, that like you can't, angels aren't owned by any one religious community. They're available for anybody. Yeah. yeah. I know that your your book is almost a whole answer to this question, mm-hmm. but why do you think, and everybody, please grab this book. If this is interesting, <laughs> that you have to read Dr. Ahuvia's book, but wh- why do you think that it's important to look outside of rabbis and rabbinic texts in order to understand the importance of angels in early Jewish culture? Why, like, why look at things like uh, what we could call Jewish magic? I have to remember that right, the rabbis formed um, a minority um, in the ancient world and that there were always many ways to be Jewish and imagine one's connection and relationship with the divine. So I think especially for people who have felt excluded from contemporary forms of, of Judaism, it can just be helpful to understand how rich and variable 
um, ancient Jewish belief was. And I think that's what was important to me in my book is that I wanted to center ancient Jews, um, not just rabbis, because even though the rabbis became very influential, they had to be in relationship with the people, the other Jews around them, other people around them. And so what the ordinary Jew believed does influence the rabbinic right imagination, what becomes normative Judaism. But we can't just look to the rabbis to understand normative Judaism. So I, I do think that looking at magic, but also like liturgical poetry, what people were actually singing, what they were actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis is really important um, for understanding just how we got to where we are today, you know, regardless of your religious identity. Definitely. To speak on where we are today, yeah. would you agree with the contention that the angels have been excised from most aspects of contemporary Judaism? Um, I would say that, you know, angels have been excised from a particular kind of Protestant American <laughs> civic religion, right? <laughs> um, and I say it's because of, of influenced by uh, Robert Orsi, who has written about, about um, American religion, especially Catholicism. Um, you know, he says that angels kind of went out of style when, in the development of representative democracy. Right, because you don't need angels if you're supposed if you have elected officials. <laughs> oh, the old. Like the ideal, he sort of says, like in a ideal, you know, an ideal nation state, the, the citizen doesn't appeal to the invisible realm; it appeals to the representative. Um, so I do think American Judaism is obviously influenced by these larger hegemonic um, you know, traditions, but. You know, often when I when I do talk to Jews who consider themselves observant, they will say, well, like, where are the angels in Judaism? And I ask them, well, do you sing the song Shalom Aleichem on Friday evening? So if you Google Shalom Aleichem, this is the song. Um, it's a very popular melody. It goes back to mystics. We think in like the 17th century, the melody is about 100 years old. It was devised in Brooklyn, but it's literally sung the world over by Jews. And Shalom Aleichem is all about welcoming the angels into the home on a Friday evening. So sometimes when you say like, well, where are the angels? And I ask them, well, do you sing Shalom Aleichem? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what are the words? Like, <laughs> Just think about, you know, the words of the song. And they just like haven't, they've been singing it, but they haven't thought about how they're literally welcoming angels into their home asking for the angels a blessing and then asking the angels to depart peacefully so i asked them also if they know the nighttime shema which you mentioned i asked them to think about the amidah right the those are the two most important prayers in judaism right are the shema right you say morning and night the amidah which you say in, in the synagogue of three times a day right like both of them have a core significance to angels you know and, and then i asked them about like story you know the most important stories in the jewish tradition about abraham and hagar and others and isaiah and they're like oh yeah the angels are <laughs> are everywhere but we've been taught to like unthink this sort of right or disappear it because maybe angels seem christian um because maybe they seem frivolous because you know in the 18th and 19th century angels start to be depicted as feminine and suddenly they become trivial you know, so there's lots of like modern forces that make people kind of unsee the the angels and their traditions. But I hope that, you know, reading my book and like kind of re-encountering this, um, I don't know, it makes them realize just uh, people are like literate in the traditions that they're that surround them already, right? To understand the scripts that they've been raised with so they can make more informed choices going forward <laughs> about their own religiosity <laughs> yeah that's my hope for them this whole episode could could be answered by the question that i'm, I'm going to ask but mm -hmm. how important were angels to judaism is it one of those things where it can't be overstated how important they were I mean, I think, again, I would go like, how important, I would restate the question as how important were angels to the Jewish people in different periods of history? And I would say that from what I can tell, angels were really important and gave people confidence in their daily lives, you know, from morning to night, at birth, you know, pregnancy, and at death, too, right? The belief that angels will greet you at death so 
Yeah, it's they're very like intimate presence. And I think sometimes we underestimate the things right that are closest to home. And that's kind of where the, the angels are, right? They're on our shoulders in our homes <laughs> um, and, and sort of in present. So yeah, I guess I would say it's, it's hard to underestimate their significance, but precisely because they're so kind of ordinary and intimate, they are kind of taken for granted or invisible. Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahuvia, for, for sharing all of this. Truthfully, I, I love your book. Uh, on my right, Michael. On my left, Gabrielle. It is a wonderful examination of, of early ideas and how we can read all we want about a rabbinic interpretation and whatnot, but this one, you're using archaeological evidence, like things like the incantation bowls and amulets. We haven't even talked about the amulets. The amulets are a really interesting <laughs> thing as well, yeah. but it, it it is a wonderful book. I want everybody to uh, to go out and grab it because this, this is the book to read. If this kind of stuff is interesting to you, I've read a lot about this stuff, a lot. And Dr. Huvia's book is by far the best I've, I've come across as far as uh, early conceptions of angels, without a doubt. So grab this book. And, and I have to ask you, is there anything else? Are, are you done with angels or, or, or is it like you got a brand now? Do you have to, is, what's what's next for for you, Dr. Huvia? Yeah. So uh, hopefully the next couple of years, I'll finish another short book on angels. And it'll be like angels in late antique religion. So not just in Judaism, but um, in Zoroastrianism. Um, and, and Christianity and like in other uh, religions of the late antique Mediterranean. I'm also co-editing a book on biblical bestiaries. <laughs> so, oh, cool. Because, you know, angels are an interesting kind of beast they in are. the Bible. <laughs> I thought that would be fun. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still working with the, the creatures of the invisible realm and, and, and the biblical and the earthly realm and the beasts themselves. So keep an eye out for that. And if you are interested in my book um, this winter season, um, I have shared a discount code. So please do do use it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. In the show notes for this episode, everybody, there will be a discount code. And it's it, it's very kind of you. 30% off this book. Uh, I love this book. It's amazing. It was mentioned uh, by another guest of mine, Dr. Justin Sledge. And he's like, oh. oh, this is interesting. I have to go out and find it. And it did not disappoint in any way. It is a wonderful book. So yes, please, everybody, go to whatmagicisthis.com, find this episode, and get the discount code to grab Dr. Mika Ahuvia's book, On My Right, Michael, On My Left, Gabriel. And also on whatmagicisthis.com, there's going to be some wonderful show notes for certain things that we've talked about today, as well as some other stuff, but it is all worth looking into. I spent a lot of time on those show notes, so please check them out. Do you think I'm doing something kind of special with this podcast? Well, I would like to think so as well. And there's a few things I just want to talk about real briefly. Uh, the first is that I am trying really hard to make sure that I don't have ads on this podcast because I personally think that ads ruin podcasts. But unfortunately, it's the world we live in right now where ad revenue is actually quite good and some people can basically sponsor their entire work via putting ads in their podcasts. I recently listened to a brand new podcast that I was really excited about and half of it was ads and I just, I can't do that anymore. And so I don't want to have ads here on what magic is this. So I rely entirely on your support. If you are listening to what magic is this, uh, what this episode is first released. So we're going to be talking about the, uh, the second week here within November of 2022. Uh, it's my birthday week uh, and there would be nothing that would delight me more than uh, to see some of you support this show. I have thousands of listeners. There's so many listeners that I have. If even a hundred of you decided that you wanted to try and support my show in some way, it would literally change my life. It would be one of the most wonderful things to happen to me. So I don't want to sound like I'm begging or anything like that. Um, 
everything is getting kind of expensive as far as trying to run the podcast. And for something as simple as supporting me on Patreon, which is only $7 a month, and it gets you access to a whole different part of my show, one that is really quite wonderful. I, I just did an episode about how to start doing Solomonic Magic. It's going to be a series. But if that kind of thing is interesting to you and, and you enjoy this show and it gives you a lot to think about and a lot of aspects to ways of looking at magic and how maybe you want to start out doing magic, then Patreon is is truly the best way of showing your support. And as I said, if just a hundred of you decide in the next two to three months to, to start to support my show, my life changes drastically. It's already pretty great. This is my, this is my job. This is what I do for a living. But uh, uh, the amount of work that I put into this show, um, I'm probably being paid close to, I don't know, something like $15, $16 an hour, which uh, is, you know, it's not bad. It's just not great. That's Canadian, by the way. So $15 Canadian is like um, $3 American. I spend a lot of time doing this uh, this podcast. And so the thing that I would hate to have to do which a lot of podcasters do, uh, is to try and put ads on their show. So I'm really going to try and avoid that. Again, if just a hundred of you change your mind to try and, uh, to try and basically be like, you know what, Doug deserves that extra $7 a month. I'm going to go to patreon.com slash what magic is this, or head to what magic is this.com and click on any one of the Patreon links so I can keep Doug doing the thing that he loves to do and that he's somewhat good at. And that's it. Seven dollars a month. Um, it is a wonderful Patreon, and it's basically um, another show. It's almost a totally separate show than what I do. So that's that's my birthday slash Christmas wish is just for a few more people to to make that leap from being just a casual listener to a supporter of the things that I do. And I, I do put in a lot of work to them and I would greatly appreciate it. Or or even just supporting me through PayPal. If you head to What Magic Is This, find any one of those PayPal links, then give that a click and you can donate any amount of money. And it goes right back into making this, this podcast. Um, as I said, it's not cheap and it's getting more and more expensive with each, almost every three months. It's like, oh, here's another thing you need to spend money on to keep your podcast going. So anyhow... I guess I'm just saying if you enjoy the podcast and you have the means to support, please consider supporting my work either through Patreon, that's at patreon.com slash whatmagicisthis, or through PayPal, or through buying uh, some of my merchandise, which is available at whatmagicisthis.com. So yes, birthday wishes, Christmas wishes, uh, but just general wishes to keep this podcast ad-free and to keep me... Uh, being able to do the thing that I do, that I love, and I hope it shows through each and every episode that I release. All right, that's the spiel. But again, everything available at whatmagicisthis.com. Dr. Huvia, thank you so much for sharing yeah, all of you. your knowledge. Um, this has been an absolute joy. I hope if at some point in the future we wanted to have you back on the show, you'd, you'd be agreeable to do so. Of course. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that's it. Ain't That's the angels. So come on back to uh, what magic is this where we'll talk about all of this other strange, fiery, uh, breathing lakes and rivers of fire and 58 eyeballs attached to wing stuff that we like to call magic and mysticism and the occult. Until next time, everybody, I want you all to stay healthy, stay hopeful and stay luminous. We will talk at you soon. Goodbye, everybody. A doi shem ni shmurtzei shkhovo yecho Miyah